Hello, listeners. Jordan here. I just want to let you know that you can listen to Nighttime early and ad-free on Amazon Music. Include it with Prime. You are tuned to the Nighttime Podcast, focused on the fringe of Canada. When a person sees something they can't explain in the night sky, theirs can be an easy tale to ignore. If you take that same experience, but make the eyewitnesses a collection of unrelated observers all telling the same story, regardless of your opinions on the UFO phenomena, it commands attention. Tonight's story is one of those amazing UFO sightings that will make even the most skeptical scratch their head in wonder. In tonight's topic, the eyewitnesses include an entire community, in addition to the 10 RCMP officers who arrived to the scene in response to multiple reports of a downed aircraft. As compelling as the sheer number of witnesses makes this case, what solidifies it as one of the most credible UFO sightings in the world and earns it the name Canada's Roswell is the government investigation into the event that continues to come to light even to this day. Tonight's story is the Shag Harbor Incident of 1967. When I decided to begin production of the Nighttime Podcast, I first compiled a list of 50 stories I wanted to share. The list started with my grandparents' UFO sighting. Tonight's story is just the second on the list. The reason I'm now at episode 22, just getting to the Shag Harbor incident, is because I wanted to take the time to speak with and get to know the key players involved and hopefully provide a respectable telling of this complicated story. During the episode, the story will be told via excerpts of an interview I conducted with the ufologist who's been actively pursuing the truth in this event for now over 20 years. I'll let him introduce himself to you. My name is Chris Stiles. I'm an independent UFO researcher, and my first involvement with the UFO phenomena was to open a reinvestigation of the Shag Harbor incident in uh, 1992. What Chris Stiles didn't say is that he wrote my two favorite books on the topic, he appears in any documentary on this sighting worth a damn, and that his dog style of investigation earned him a spot among the elite in the Canadian UFO research community. I was fortunate enough to visit Chris in his home for an extended conversation on all things UFO, and of course to hear him describe the many key moments of the Shag Harbor incident. After Chris Stiles walks us through the event, the episode will conclude with a discussion between UFO researcher Chris Rutkowski and I. If, like me, you were obsessed with the NBC show Unsolved Mysteries, you may remember him from his appearances there. At present, Mr. Rutkowski and the Canadian UFO survey he releases annually serves as almost a central hub for all things UFO research in Canada. This will be the first of a two-part series. The second episode, which will be released shortly, will include the testimony of a key witness to the Shag Harbor incident, Mr. Laurie Wickens. Now, with the introductions out of the way, let's get into it. Although the actual incident on Shag Harbor is often discussed as a standalone, isolated event, its story actually begins in the weeks prior. The incident itself is viewed by many ufologists as the climax of a very unusual time in Atlantic Canada's skies. This period, late summer to fall of 67, is known among Canadian UFO enthusiasts as a period of intense UFO activity unequaled at any time in Canada, possibly even in the world. To look back through the historical record, one will see our dark skies have always been active, but without any warning or any obvious reason, the frequency and credibility of these unexplained aerial events increased dramatically and continued to increase over a period of weeks. Although many of the reports are of those single witness anecdotal type reports I mentioned earlier, collectively they carry a heavy weight. It's in the days just preceding Shag Harbor where the most puzzling and most credible reports were heard. One such report was by Air Canada pilot Pierre Charbonneau, who was en route to Toronto from the Halifax International Airport. He was seated in the cockpit just after dusk when he noticed a brilliantly lit rectangular object to approach his aircraft and fly parallel alongside it. 
He immediately pointed it out to his co-pilot, Bob Ralph, who also observed the object and the string of smaller lights that trailed behind it, kind of like the tail of a kite. As they watched the object, there was what appeared to be a large explosion that surrounded it, although they didn't hear a sound. The object and its trailing lights seemed to come to a complete stop and remain stationary within the cloud that formed around the explosion. The two pilots watched it for a few minutes until the object and the cloud that surrounded it slowly passed out of sight behind their aircraft. The night of October 4th, 1967 is when the activity really hit its fever pitch. As reports began to pour in from all across the province of Nova Scotia, it became apparent that something special was happening in the skies. When I spoke with Chris Stiles, he described what many now call the night of the UFOs. In this clip, he'll also reflect on the sighting he experienced that night as a 12-year-old boy on the Dartmouth waterfront. Here's some of what Chris had to say about it. Many UFO researchers uh, view this as a sort of mini flap period. Uh, a time of uh, frequent and intense UFO activity. And, and amongst a lot of local researchers, it's often referred to as the night of the UFOs. But, and that fits within a week, and in fact, perhaps a month of heightened activity. Um, sightings were extant over the whole province. And there was a certain commonality of sightings. There were many orange spheres seen, the often referred to as orbs, uh, often featureless things. There were um, some exotic craft seen, three sections, lozenge shaped sort of craft uh, that were seen around Metro and the Bedford area, large UFOs, mothership types, and of course, series of flashing lights where people weren't sure they were seeing a solid object, but perhaps a, what I like to think of as a soft UFO and everything in between. Yeah, I understand you had a, a personal experience during this. Well, seeing is believing, and one of the things that has made the phenomenon, even before I became involved in it, pertinent to me, was a personal sighting that stems from the same night as the Shack Harbor incident in Dartmouth, Nova Scotia. Can you describe that? Well, what I saw, Jordan, was uh, basically a featureless sphere, but it wasn't small, it was large. It would have been perhaps 60 feet through on the axis, which is quite a large orb. It was absolutely featureless, glowed a dull orange. And it appeared to be the, the best way I can describe is the color of you is that of when you put iron in a fire when it first begins to glow. Now, I was hardly the only one to see this. It was reported in the Halifax Herald and was seen from people on the McDonald Bridge and on the ferry. And I watched it kind of trace the shoreline of the Dartmouth Cove area before it headed out to sea and gained altitude. And the thing is, when I saw this, it was... Um, <laughs> It, it left an impression that never goes away. With it now established that the evening sky was certainly unique on October 4th of 67, we begin to approach the climax of this rapidly building aerial activity. It is at this point in our story that we make our way to sleepy Shag Harbor, Nova Scotia. As the night of the UFOs approaches its conclusion, it has one final spectacle in store for us. I'll cut to an excerpt of my conversation with Chris Stiles, where he sets the stage nicely and describes the first moments of the Shag Harbor incident. Well, Shag Harbor is a, is a fishing village, plain, pure, and simple. It's on the coast, of course. You're looking out into the Gulf of Maine, and there was less lighting on the roads in those days, and all these things kind of play into the sighting being so noticed. On the night of October the 4th, 67, the moon had set by the time of the sighting, and the atmospheric conditions were absolutely perfect for observation. You know, what you call a very transparent sky. Things seemed to start around 11.20 p.m. local time. The moon had set. It's very dark out. It's a fishing village. Not many people are up. There's little lighting on the road. So if you are awake and outside driving around, having a walk, taking your dog or whatever, and you looked up, you would have noticed what was going on in the sky. And what was going on, what people were seeing who looked up, was that there was a series of lights that first flew in from an easterly direction. And what they saw was four lights that flashed in sequence, and they had an unusual pattern. They would come on one, two, three, four, and then they would all flash together. And this would repeat over and over again. These lights stayed over the sound, which is the locals' name for the harbor there at Shag Harbor, hovered there for several minutes. 
tilted to a 45 degree angle and descended rapidly to the water's surface. And though some who were near reported the sound of an explosion, others simply saw lights come down to the water. Several people called the nearby RCMP detachment in Barrington Passage and they came and arrived on the scene. And what's interesting is that two patrol cars arrived from two different directions. One containing two officers came from the detachment and one of the others was out on the highway patrol, Constable Ron Pond. He saw the UFO both in the air and as all the Mounties would see in a gathering crowd is that the UFO was still on the water when they got there. To recap and elaborate slightly on what Chris just described, at this stage of the event, it's just after 11 p.m., multiple people in the Shag Harbor area witness a line of lights traveling across the sky at a fairly low altitude. The lights are said to have been slowly blinking on and off one at a time, not unlike the lights on the wing of an airplane. As the lights travel towards the harbor, they descend it rapidly, ultimately crashing into the dark waters. As the first call came into the local RCMP, it was to report a crashed aircraft. The telephone operator responded by asking the caller, Mr. Lori Wickens, if he had been drinking. But as the telephone lines quickly became flooded with other calls reporting the exact same thing, every officer in the area was sent to the scene. As the officers arrived at the shoreline, they were met by a growing crowd of witnesses, including that original caller, Lori Wickens. As they all stood together, looking out into the harbor, they all agreed on one thing. There was certainly something illuminated on the harbor, and it appeared to be sinking. Chris will pick up from there. It no longer looked like four flashing lights, but simply a pale yellow dome of light moving out. Some believe it was moving under its own power. Others say just probably floating in the ebb tide. They watched it for several minutes, and the RCMP commandeered two local boats, where, which men were on the outside of the tie, well-equipped, and these were boats that, uh, you know, had radar and, you know, were well equipped. As they were sailing toward the UFO, the light extinguished or went out before they could reach it. And when they get to the last known surface position, they find something very odd. They find a streak of yellow foam, and this is dense foam, that's still welling to the surface. And by the time they get to it, it's estimated to be about 80 feet wide and a half mile in length. And it was described as yellowish, sparkling. Some of them say it smelt of sulfur. Some say it had no odor. But all the men agreed that were there at this time was that it was not normal tidal foam. It eventually broke up in the ebbing tide. The men searched at that last known surface position until about 3 a.m. They were augmented by the Coast Guard, which came from nearby Clark's Harbor. The search was called off at 3 a.m. and resumed at first light. Yeah, this was a, a search for survivors of an airplane crash is what they're expecting at this point. Yes, well now we come up to one of the key features of this case that makes it quite significant is that one of the things that's unusual here is that no one reported a UFO. Like I say, seven people called right away. In fact, the first witness who you have dealt with, Laurie Wickens, a uh, local fisherman, um, they questioned his uh, veracity when he first reported it, but very quickly six others called in. And the other witnesses were at different vantage points. Some were on Bear Point Road, Maggie Guerin's Point, seeing it, and all reported either four lights or three, depending on their angle of view. Now, everybody that called was quite excited to report the UFO, and like again, no one called it a UFO. They called simply to say, we've seen lights go into the harbor. We think there's been a plane crash. No one reported a UFO. And it's even more significant when that label was eventually hung on it by the next day by the authorities, the RCMP, who were re-questioning witnesses or touching base or uh, gathering further information. At the time when this thing entered the water and when it disappeared, uh, submerged, whichever, they were also, of course, in contact with two nearby bases, Canadian Forces Station Barrington at Baccaro, which was a NORAD radar facility, and the top secret base, Canada's most secret base at the time, Canadian Forces Station, Shelburne. Shelburne was the coordination center for submarine detection for the whole Atlantic. At the time, it was a shared facility with the U.S. Navy, 50% uh, staffed by either. And after communicating with these two bases and the rescue coordination center in Halifax, 
uh, a picture was starting to emerge, and by the next morning, authorities, the RCMP, certainly spokesmen in Ottawa, were referring to this as a UFO case. No missing or late aircraft, and no explanation for forthcoming. With the mysterious light now completely dissolved below a harbor covered in unusually thick foam, and with no sign of aircraft debris on the surface, the search is suspended until sunrise. As the emergency responders and the crowd of puzzled onlookers return to their homes, all scratching their respective heads, the events during the night of the Shag Harbor incident have concluded. It's relevant to say at this point that what happened on the waters and in the air that night has a special amount of credibility not just due to the RCMP and the Canadian Coast Guard officials who were on the scene witnessing the events, but also due to the presence of the local fishermen like Laurie Wickens, who spent the better part of their lives navigating those waters and staring up at those skies. When I spoke with Chris Stiles, he had a lot to say about this detail and why he considered their claims so very compelling. I'm sure there are people out there in your audience that look at this and say, Well, you have a bunch of local fishermen. They're not sure what they saw. But I'm going to suggest to you that if you earn your living in boats at sea, you better be pretty sure what you're looking at. And you don't cry uh, that there's a disaster or shoot a flare off or do anything on this unless you're quite sure. Your life depends on it. If you don't know what you're doing out there, if you don't know local conditions and what you're looking at, not only are you not going to make money, but you probably won't hang on to your life too long. The sea is a harsh mistress. So I have every bit of respect for these men. And, you know, the men in the Coast Guard that came at the time, they had no special training, but they were men that knew the local water and conditions well. And I think that, uh, you know, if you're out there and you're in trouble, you don't want anybody else but them coming for you. Believe me, a sheepskin on the wall doesn't do a lot of good. But my point is these men are very sure. They know what flares look like. You know, they know what meteorites look like. They see them at night. They're out there in all kinds of conditions and weather. And, you know, you can trust their observations. Remember, these aren't the men that claimed they saw an unidentified flying object. These are the men that were concerned. When they went out there, they told me they felt sick to their stomach. Because, you know, it's a lot like what happened in, uh, you know, Peggy's Cove when the Swiss Air 111 went down. You're going out and you don't know what you're going to find, right? And the things you're seeing in this case aren't making sense either. You know, so as the information's coming in, you know, there's an emotional reaction, right? Nobody here was trying to bring attention to themselves and glory. They're just struggling to understand what's unfolding before them. And they're getting strange messages. And when they do get the first few answers from authorities, it's not anything they expected to hear. But, you know, as no aircraft become missing or late, the list of what's left becomes quite short. And when they start hearing an unidentified flying object, many of them were reluctant to believe it. With the bizarre night behind them, the majority of the witnesses, including Laurie Wickens and the fisherman Chris had just described, all gather at the shoreline of Shag Harbor awaiting the return of the RCMP and the Coast Guard. It wouldn't be long before the authorities would return with a team of divers to search the bottom of the harbor. I'll cut back to Chris and allow him to discuss the events of that next morning. Well, the people were around the shoreline the next day, and there are some old photos of all the old 60 cars sitting there watching the effort. The RCMP went back the next day with the Coast Guard Lifeboat 101 from Clark's Harbor, and they, they took a look. Lori Wickens and other witnesses, uh, you know, were back on the boat, like Norm Smith, and they were looking around trying to figure what was going on. Their preliminary was look was done with RCMP divers who found nothing. Eventually, like I say, the fleet diving unit arrived and they were in the water by noon of Friday. And they each day they dove to last light, so they had all day Saturday and Sunday from first light to last light. They did grid patterns and according to the military te- telexes I had, eventually they searched an area that would have measured a mile and a half by a mile, like a large rectangle. And according to them they found absolutely nothing of interest. On Sunday evening, which would have been, what, the 8th, uh, you know, that's it. They pulled the plug on it. The next morning, there's a press release, which picked up in the newspaper, saying that there was no results of the search effort. Don't know what it was. Guess it was one of those things. And being Nova Scotia, most people went home and made a sandwich and forgot about it. With the divers concluding their investigation and reporting nothing of note on the harbor floor, the crowd of onlookers disperse. The story, however, would continue in the local papers over the coming days. 
In fact, the story of the media's handling of the Shake Harbor incident could be its own episode of the Nighttime Podcast. I'll let Chris Stiles walk us through that. Because there's a bit of a story with the media that's interesting. Eventually, it does come to the retention. The lead is handed to Ray McLeod, who's a staff reporter at the time. Uh, Ray does the basic footwork, makes some phone calls, and is surprised very quickly, gets referred to Squadron Leader William Bain at the air disc. And to Ray's surprise, Bain tells him, hey, you know, yes, we investigate UFOs, I'm with the RSAF, we're the air disc, blah, blah, blah. And uh, one of the things that shocks him is he says, listen, uh, we think this is a real case and there may be something concrete in and we're coming down to give it our best kick at the can that we can. We think this is one of those cases where there is something real, physical on the ground, or under the water in this case. And, you know, we, he gives some other references and ideas and what may be happening, how excited they are in Ottawa about this. And uh, what happens at first is Ray takes it to a number of fellow staffers, you know, because he was a junior reporter at the time and says, um, what do you think about this? I checked my sources. Do you think we can run with this? And everybody looked at it and said, oh, God, Ray, UFOs. Uh, show it to so-and-so. Show it to Wilkie Taylor. Show it to this guy. Show it to that guy. And eventually, Ray ends up showing his research and his story to the managing night editor, uh, Harold Shea. And to his surprise, everybody's been growingly negative as he goes up the chain of command till he gets to Harold Shea, and Harold looks at it. He says, you know what? This is going to be the headline story tomorrow on Saturday. And Ray is shocked and says, really? Are you sure? Yeah, absolutely. He goes, well, why? He says, because I know these things are real. I was coming back one night with my wife from a wedding at Queensland Beach, he says, and we seen one of these things come low over our car, and we were quite terrified, etc., etc. So, the story gets published Saturday. Could be something concrete in Shag Harbor UFO crash, RCAF. Two-inch red headlines in the Herald, which is startling because the Herald is perhaps at the time Canada's most conservative broadsheet. It's not the National Enquirer. Well, come Monday morning after that weekend, Ray goes into work at the Herald in downtown Halifax, and he walks in the door, and the girl at the desk says, "You're wanted in the office with Mr. Dennis, the publisher owner." editor-in-chief, etc., of the Halifax Chronicle Herald. And when he goes in there, Harold Shea is already in there. And while he's in there, the phone is ringing on Mr. Dennis' desk. He said, did you hear that? You guys did that. Do you know what that is? And he picked it up and answered it with some more questions about a UFO when he hung up. He says, we're scaring people. We are not in the business to scare people. And he looks at Harold Shea and he says, you're coming up to the day shift. And you, he says, you're going to be handling, what is it? Uh, weddings, bar mitzvahs, and cement pourings for some time. <laughs> <laughs> so, Mr. Dennis took the story away from Ray and from Harold Shea and gave it to somebody who he described as British cha- trained and able to follow orders, right? And um, he followed the party line and uh, Mr. Dennis sent him to the late father, Michael Burke Graffiti and Rostronber, who told him some very interesting things that weren't true, like he wasn't interested in UFOs, because at the time he was a paid UFO investigator for the government. Also referred him to talk to a professor at Wolfville, Rupert McNeil, a geologist, and Professor Tennyson at the University of Toronto, who were with the National Research Council of Canada. And, you know, once the transfer came out of the military to NRC, they would become Canada's chief UFO investigators a few months down the road. They told the Herald that they thought it was a super secret military U.S. device. I'll tell you, that device would have been real handy in Vietnam Mm -hmm. back at that time. They could have used it. Mm -hmm. Something that was both aerodynamic and hydrodynamic would have been pretty nifty. Despite the media uncovering evidence that the government was taking their investigation into the event seriously, as the story finishes making its rounds through the local papers, the attention paid to the Shag Harbor incident dissolves. This isn't the end of the story, however. Things will pick up again the next weekend with another strange event, one that many UFO theorists believe to be the sighting of whatever crashed into the water that night, slowly exiting the harbor and flying off to wherever it came from. Chris will explain these events and describe some of his investigation into the Shag Harbor incident now. One week later to the hour, 
in Shag Harbor, again, you have two sets of lights, but this time they're coming up out of the water of the sound. Actually, a little farther, or probably toward the Shag Harbor Rip, as it's known. And they come up, and these lights are seen by a local family known as the Camerons. And the whole family comes out and watches these things. They first thought something was unusual because it interfered with their television. They were watching. They went outside, and again, you had a series of four lights. One of them yellow, one of them red, emerge out of the water and fly away out to the Gulf of Maine. This one also was reported to RCMP, and they came in and did an investigation. Strangely enough, this one again got local press, but it was also reported as far away as the National Enquirer. You see, the Shag Harbor investigation kind of eclipsed all these other sightings because people thought they'd seen something come down and hit the water, and there was a military follow-up investigation. And even though it was canceled, um, some people thought there's more to it, and if the Navy is they say a lot of the local people who are interviewed say, well, if the Navy really found something, they probably couldn't say anyway. Then you have this sighting a week later, you know, known as the Cameron sighting. But that even that's not the end of it, because a month later, on November the 2nd, something strange occurs in the media again. In every newspaper in Nova Scotia, you have, in some cases on the front page, an appeal, and it says, military wants UFOs reported. And this story and the basic explanation of how to do that properly is attributable to the author of this, which is Major Victor Eldridge. Major Eldridge at the time was the executive officer at Canadian Forces Station Barrington and Back Row. He also served as a sort of stringer for all military reports to the weekly newspapers. Very unusual a month later to have this. An interesting side note to this is the years later when I was finding the initial eyewitnesses, people such as Laurie, the Three Mounties, etc., one of the people I decided to speak to was Major Eldridge. And when I tracked him down and I called to ask him about what he remembered about the Shag Harbors, and he didn't seem to know what I was talking about, and when I went to explain it to him, he said, oh, well, there was lots of crazy things happening then. I said, well, let me read from your, your story in that. And he says, well, what is it you're trying to do? And I said, well, I'm just trying to get to the truth of this. Well, he says, uh, I can assure you it was nothing. I said, well, how can you do that? You just told me a while ago you did not remember it, and now you're certain it was nothing. And there's a long pause, so I gave a little push and said, well, sir, I said I was hoping not have to resort to speculation as to your role in this. And he said, you should be very careful. I just have to make one call. And there was a very threatening thing after that. This is the only time this ever happened. Now, I attribute to this to just an overzealous individual who, you know, took his duty very seriously, because I have to say at this point, at a later date, I spoke to a later commanding officer of the base who, along with me and Don Ledger on a similar cases on that period, was very helpful. But um, it does make you wonder, if they were through with the case, why a month later they were appealing all over Nova Scotia for information. They may have ended the underwater search. They had not ended the investigation. As it stands today, the wheels of the investigation into Shag Harbor are still turning, mainly with Chris Stiles at the controls. When I visited him at his home, he had countless boxes of government documents related to this event. Hopefully, there's enough to fill another of his great books. As far as what happened that night, and the weeks before and after it, it's anyone's guess. One thing is certain, though, and that is that something happened. I'll conclude this episode with a discussion on the broader topic of UFO activity in Canada with the man that all other ufologists report to. With over 30 years of research into the UFO phenomenon and 10 published books on the topic, Chris Rutkowski has taken it upon himself to collect, compile, and analyze the information contained in all Canadian UFO sightings. I spoke to Chris recently about UFO sightings in Canada and, of course, about the Shag Harbor incident and its significance. I've been involved in uh, studying the UFO phenomenon since the 70s, so it does date me a little bit. Um, And uh, I have 
a background in astronomy and education. Uh, my, my degrees in astronomy and education allow me to, to look at the UFO phenomena from a number of different perspectives. So through astronomy, I, I understand the, the problems associated with, you know, is it possible for aliens to travel between the stars and where might they be if there are such, uh, such things. Uh, and in education, I like conveying the information to the public to, uh, so I can make people understand uh, what a rich phenomenon this really is. So in the 70s I started investigating some UFO reports uh, in university I found myself giving talks uh, about some of the cases that had been given to me through the astronomy department. Uh, I started writing books, I started writing articles, started doing uh, some uh, some media. I was actually on the original Unsolved Mysteries TV show for, that was on NBC. Uh, since then I've been on a host of other things simply trying to, to tell the public and tell people in general what's really going on. I mean, we hear a lot of stuff about uh, sensational topics like, you know, does the government really have you know, aliens working with them in Las Vegas? Is Hillary Clinton really going to spill the beans about UFOs if she's elected? A lot of speculation and a lot of stuff that really does isn't substantiated in any way. But what we do have is a lot of information about UFO cases. And uh, back in uh, the late 1980s, I took it upon myself to get in touch with as many UFO investigators and researchers in Canada as possible to try and get data on how many cases there were. We had no idea how many reports of UFOs there were in Prince Edward Island versus uh, Newfoundland versus Alberta versus Saskatchewan. Were the colors of UFOs different? Were they at different times of the day or night? Uh, were uh, uh, you know, were there any other characteristics that were unique or did they change from month to month and year to year? So we wanted to get a handle on that so it, to help us understand what's really going on. So since 1989, I've been putting together the Canadian UFO Survey, uh, which looks at all the reports that are filed in Canada in any given year. Now, the story that led me to you is I'm working on right now is Nova Scotia's own Shag Harbor incident. I've, I've heard many people call it Canada's Roswell. C can you explain how the Shag Harbor incident fits in the history of UFO sightings in Canada and how it stacks up in terms of credibility with other sightings you've, you've researched? Well, yeah, Shag Harbor actually is uh, a fascinating case. Um, there's no question something occurred back in 1967. In fact, 1967 was a banner year for UFOs, uh, especially in Canada but all across North America. It's also the same year the Falcon Lake UFO case in Manitoba, uh, a Rivers case as well. Uh, there were reports um, out in Duhamel, Alberta where the first crop circle, believe it or not, was found in, in Canada in 1967. So uh, it, there are a lot of things happening in Canada right across the country. So this fits in nicely with that and uh, uh, what's curious is that we do have some documentation. Now, there's not a lot of documentation, though it's described as Canada's Roswell. It's actually a little bit better than Roswell because Roswell, we actually don't have documentation that a UFO was actually seen and and um, you know something was found after it had passed through. Roswell, the American government and the military has always insisted that nothing happened. Uh, that it was nothing to worry about. Uh, it may have been a mistake, or the pieces of metal, you know, were were pretty trivial, and and always oh, just just nothing. Don't worry about it. But in the case of Shag Harbor, we have documents that say that something actually was seen, not only by civilians but by uh, RCMP, and something actually was seen to fall into the ocean, and a number of people uh, went out in boats to locate or try and locate and, and offer, offer some help as a rescue mission of whatever had fallen into the uh, into the sea. So we have this documentation. There's a further documentation about um, an attempt uh, that was recommended to try and locate whatever was uh, underwater. So there there is a whole plethora of information about what happened and uh, it really does outshine the Roswell case for that reason because we do know something happened and we can pinpoint an X as to say something happened right here. 
Exactly. And it just the amount of witnesses the, and the credibility of the witnesses. You have the local fishermen, the all the, the community, basically, as it was said by Chris Stiles when I spoke to him, was if you were in the Shag Harbor area and looked up that night, you were going to see it. Then you also have the, the Coast Guard and the RCMP. So collectively, all of them telling the same story and having that been documented through the, uh, you know, through the historical documents that were obtained by Chris and others researching the event. Uh, like you say, I, I can't imagine something didn't happen that night. I think it's unquestionable that something occurred. As far as any theory on what it could have been, can you think of anything without you know jumping to uh, you know an alien craft crashing into the harbor? Can you think of any other explanation as what what that could have been, or have you heard any theories on this? Yeah, there have been some suggestions. Um, I, I don't know how credible they are. Um, I mean, I've heard at least. Um, uh, a couple of astronomers say it was uh, a meteor or fireball falling into the uh, into the sea. Um, that certainly would explain the large number of people who had seen it. Um, it wouldn't explain uh, the uh, you know the the large sploosh and <laughs> this uh, uh, this greenish ring that was found on the on the uh, on the ocean when boats had gone out to see it. I mean there there are some possibilities, but the other. Uh, explanation that I haven't heard a lot of uh, description of uh, recently is something I, I suspect might have something going for it uh, is the uh, a drop of a Corona satellite film canister. Um, now this was a very highly classified program that in fact wasn't even released to the public until 1995 so we're talking 30 years after the fact uh, where um, during the Cold War uh, the United States was uh, using satellites and uh, high-altitude um, balloons and things like that to take photographs over Russia and places uh, of interest. Uh, and then uh, as the, the orbit continued over North America, it passed directly over eastern Canada and film canisters would be released from the satellite or, or high-altitude vehicle and dropped down where they would be retrieved in air, ideally, or in some cases actually dropped right into the ocean and retrieved by submarine. Now this of course makes a lot of sense uh, if in t context of Shag Harbor because we do know there was a US Navy base near there, we do know there was underwater activity that people had reported seeing, uh, US Navy vessels and so forth, frogmen and all sorts of wild stories. So it could have been that although uh, you know, we simply won't have any information especially something ho so highly classified a lot of the records I'm sure have been uh, destroyed by now, but what we do know is that this was an actual project that was dropping things into the ocean in that area. That's the only explanation I can come up with other than something else otherworldly. That will conclude tonight's episode. If you're interested in hearing more content from the Nighttime Podcast, you may be interested in joining the Nighttime Patron Group, where for $1 a month, you'll have access to a monthly bonus episode. You can join by visiting patreon.com slash nighttime podcast. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash nighttime podcast. And with that said, on behalf of myself and the show listeners, I'd like to thank the continued support of the Nighttime Patron Group and welcome the newest members to the group, Kyle and Deborah. In addition to providing me pride and motivation, your support makes the production of this show possible. I'd like to thank you for listening to the Nighttime Podcast. If you enjoy your time here, please rate, review, and subscribe to the show on iTunes. To stay up to date with the show, please follow me at facebook.com slash nighttime podcast and on Twitter where my handle is at nighttime pod. If you have any story ideas or feedback on this show, I always enjoy hearing from you at nighttime podcast at gmail.com. The Nighttime Podcast is written, hosted, and produced by Jordan Bonaparte. Copyright Jordan Bonaparte.